She is the uh, field CTO at Comp, and she's going to talk about changing, getting microservices behaviour and not buzzwords. Please, uh, please welcome Lynn. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Melissa van der Hecht. I don't speak Dutch, I wouldn't try it. Um, my role is field CTO at Kong, which means I work with companies as they are adopting an API or a microservices program. Um, I advise them on their architectural strategy, the strategy around user adoption, measuring business value, making sure that we can def define, implement, and then scale out on an ongoing basis microservices. Um, I was at MuleSoft for five years before that doing exactly the same thing. So I've worked with quite a lot of different companies of all different shapes and sizes, all different types of development methods. Um, and I just want to share with you in 20 minutes, which is a big challenge, we can talk about this for days, but I just want to share with you um, some of the key lessons that I've learned. Uh, before I start, out of interest, who knows what microservices are? Nice. I mean, I'm about... Mm. Um, who is doing microservices? Who's thinking of doing microservices? Who doesn't like microservices? Yeah, fair enough, cool. Right, I always start, whenever I meet um, a client for the first time, I always start by asking them the exact same question. Why are you doing microservices? Bonus points if you can name that tune, by the way. Um, the, Someone said that's you always correct. <laughs> um, so the reason I ask this is doing microservices takes a lot of investment, takes a lot of time. It's really hard to do. And it's not going to do us any favors. In fact, it's going to be detrimental to our business if we don't understand why we're doing it, if we're not actually trying to achieve specific business outcomes. Let me give you a couple of examples. Amazon. We all know Amazon. Everyone talks about how great Amazon are at services. Jeff Bezos issued his mandate in 2002 that basically said, every single team, if you don't make sure that you expose your data via services, you will be fired. Um, that is what he said in pretty much those words. They did this because it was taking Amazon weeks and months to deploy new features. We know that Amazon, as a technology company, are hugely successful and are the size that they are because they're able to operate at speed, because they're able to constantly offer new capabilities. They're just growing like crazy, right? So this mandate issued by Jeff Bezos was so that Amazon could go from deployment times of weeks and months to every 11.7 seconds they now deploy. Netflix. We all know of Netflix as a wonderful microservices example. Um, Netflix adopted microservices for a really different reason. They adopted it to make sure that their internal architecture was resilient, that it could handle outages gracefully. I mean, we don't want to sit there watching our favorite programs only for it to kind of judder or lag or break. So they had a very clear business reason and a very different one from Amazon. Uber. We all know Uber. The Uber has been a shining star of the API economy for several years. Uber started off as another San Francisco-based startup, and they built their systems around handling San Francisco Uber drivers and passengers and the city layout and the currency. And as with many companies, they grew their systems kind of organically into some unscalable monoliths. So they said, oh, we're seeing loads of success in San Francisco. We want to go into new territories. We want to open new business models. But the way that they had architected their systems meant that they couldn't scale out into these new territories. So they re-architected their systems following a microservices approach so that the same services could be reused and given the scalability across different territories. I won't ask people to name and shame. Um, what, and whenever I give examples of people I've worked with, I'm not going to name anybody. But in my head. <laughs> um, a lot of the time when I first speak to people, I ask them, why are you doing microservices? And they say, everyone else is. Duh. Or, well, we want to move to the cloud. Um, or, well, it'll, you know, it, I've been told to do this. ThoughtWorks has coined this microservice envy. It's adopting microservices because you think that you have to, not because you know why you want to. 
And I cannot say this enough, microservices is not easy. Um, there is no silver bullet, as we all know, in technology. Microservices is not a silver bullet. Microservices makes development life cycles easier, but it makes the operational side of things so much harder. It makes it so much more complex. So it's not like we're just making things easier. We're changing the nature of the problem. Um, it's a very manageable one, as I will come on to talk about. But takeaway number one from this is make sure we have a very clear reason as to why we're doing it in the first place. So now that's out of the way, I'm going to talk through the main strategy that I work on with my customers as we're going through a microservices program. Um, this is probably common sense for most of you, but this is how I like to think about things in my head. Um, three key parts to this. We have the technology. How do we build our services? How do we manage them? Where do we deploy them? Et cetera, et cetera. We've got the users of the technology. Our technology investment's completely wasted if people aren't productive when they're using it. Our microservices are useless if nobody's actually using them. So we need to have a strategy around how we get all of the different stakeholders <coughs> to adopt our services. Also around the business outcomes that we want our microservices to drive. Pointless having great technology and happy users if they're not actually doing anything that contributes value back. And you'll notice I've drawn this in a little bit of a circle. That's for a very good reason. Microservices is not an end state. It's not like, oh, this is my starting point, cool, I'm halfway through, cool, now I'm finished, move on to the next job. It's, I mean, it's a digital transformation, really. It's like any program, it is always going on. So this is not a linear journey, this is a continuous cycle of iteration and improvement. So for the rest of my presentation, I'm just going to go through some of the key aspects in this cycle, um, just share with you some examples and lessons. Starting off with the technology. Um, what technology do we use for our services? There are kind of two different schools of thought here. We can use one technology for all our services, or we can use multiple different technologies to implement our services. Let me tell you, there are lots of different types of microservices. You'll have ones that have a lot of business logic, rules, decision making. You'll have services that are much more geared towards the presentation logic. Services that are more about connectivity, transformation. These will all need slightly different tools to, to be implemented in. There is no one tool that does every single job or does it well. So make sure that your developers are empowered to use the right tool for the job. Then there also needs to be um, all the kind of associated tooling in the estate that lets you manage, govern, and operate these services. You need to have a consistent API gateway. I'll come on to that shortly. Um, you need to, and I said earlier, the operational overhead of microservices is high. We need to make sure that we put tooling in place to allow you to automate these services. Automate every single aspect of it, so version control systems, Jenkins, or Bamboo, or Maven, or whatever the technology is. We need to work out what our uh, future state architecture needs to look like. Microservices is not an architecture. Microservices is a pattern. So we need to say, this is what our future state should look like, and we're going to be implementing this with microservices, whether that is building applications themselves or building the connectivity between all the different applications. So the second question that I always ask people when introdu being introduced to them for their first time is, cool, what is a microservice for you? Um, and I get so many different responses to this question. Some people say, well, it's a 12-factor application, we've got isolated databases, automated scaling, and we're all like, yay, that's so cool, congratulations. Um, and then other people say, well, it's APIs, isn't it? I have them in a portal, they're discoverable, they give me back some JSON. Um, other people who say, oh, I have absolutely no idea, but it, it's what, ask the developers, they know. Some people can get quite attached to their definition of a microservice. I'm quite pragmatic about this. I don't really care what you mean by a microservice, so long as you all mean the same thing. Think of the problems you will cause yourself if you have two developers in your company talking about building microservices with very different ideas in their heads of what they're doing. Think about this with your architecture teams. Think about this with the people who own the budgets. Unless you have 
an agreed definition shared across your entire organization of a microservice, you're not going to be able to be successful with services. A really good example that I've seen um, of doing this, I worked with UCAS scaling out their API program. This is not an exaggeration. In the girls' loos, on the back of the cubicle doors, were posters explaining what an API is. And this didn't go deeply technical. This was just raising awareness to every single person in the company, well, every single girl in the company, of APIs, so that you become used to the term. And the fact that they had this internal marketing and the fact that they were so successful was because suddenly everybody knew why they were doing it and what they actually were. Think about API gateways. Um, I said I work for Kong. We are an API gateway and microservices platform. Um, the nature of services has changed quite dramatically, and I think this is one of the reasons why different people mean different things by a microservice. <coughs> Ten years ago, five years ago, it was all about traditional APIs. You want to expose some of our data via a RESTful API in JSON format to be consumed on a website or a mobile phone, etc., etc. 2014, along comes Docker, Kubernetes, containers, IoT, all of these new cloud native type of technologies that you suddenly need to contend with as well. Serverless, service mesh as well, as um, Liam talked about in the last session. Uh, the nature of services has changed hugely. They will continue to change. GraphQL, GRPC, event mesh, event streams. It is never ending, right? We need to make sure that as you are going through all of these changes and gradually going from one of these protocols to another, you have a consistent way of governing, securing, and having visibility of all of these services in your company. Because in the world of normal, traditional APIs, you'd have a handful, maybe a couple of hundred. In the world of microservices, you might have thousands, or tens of thousands. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is user adoption. This is one of my favorite things, and I can talk about this, honestly, for weeks on end, because it's a never-ending conversation, and it is different for every single company, so I can't give you a whole load of answers. Um, but what is important to note is, when we think of users of microservices, what most people jump to is, we have our internal developers who are building services, and we have external consumers who will be using them. They are two important groups of users, but we have a lot more. In our microservices lifecycle, we have the people who design it, they build the swagger, or the RAML, or the blueprint, or whatever it is. We have the people who build the service, whether that's in Node.js, or an ESP, or Go. We have the people who operate the service, like our DevOps teams, or API Ops, or Biz DevOps, or DevSecOps, whatever. Um, we have the people who consume the service. And we have these types of roles, probably internally and externally. And, depending on the structure of your company, across different teams as well. So actually, there's a whole load of different types of people who are comfortable with different types of technologies and skill sets that we need to bring on this journey with us. And this isn't even including people like your application owners, your product owners, your exec sponsors, who we also need to bring on this journey with us. Um, this is also one of the things I've seen companies screw up the most. So what are some of the easy things or easy-ish things to do to help? Um, post-it notes. I'm a big fan of post-it notes. Nothing quite compares to taking a post-it note from the progress file of your Kanban board, sticking it in the done section. Um, feels wonderful, very motivating. Um, whiteboards as well. Who doesn't love a whiteboard? Hackathons. They're an excellent way to start to create a bit of a buzz, get people excited. Oh, it's 24 hours, we're staying up late, we've got free beer and pizza, this is really fun. Um, labs, we all know Google Labs, Tesco have a labs. I didn't know this until recently. Um, this is the concept of developers being able to spend about 20% of their time on blue sky thinking, basically on their own projects, on things that they think will drive innovation, drive change, add value, but they're not the normal kind of BAU activities. They're not things that are coming down through the normal project pipeline. Having this kind of group of um, creative minds can lead you to achieve a whole load of cool, new, exciting things. Gamification as well. Hey, your API has been the most reliable one for the, this month. 
congratulations, here's a bit of recognition. <laughs> of your API has helped us to increase our revenue through digital channels. Um, look at the difference we're making to our business. This all sounds well and good. Um, and these are all good things to be doing, but it is very easy to fall into the trap of saying, this digital team, you're the ones who are going to be doing the microservices, you get to do all of this kind of stuff, and off you go, and be innovative. Hey, this creates a divide in the organization. Um, I've seen companies um, where there's a central IT function who are, you know, big, heavy Oracle database users, everything is like batch scripts, agile is something that they're a little bit afraid of, and then there's a very separate digital team, they're based in different cities, for example. Um, this digital team, they said, if we have to use these same processes as you're forcing on central IT, we're going to quit. The developers, a happy developer is a productive developer. An unhappy developer is going to cause so many problems. And by the way, I used to be a developer, so I feel like I can say this without causing offense, no offense. Um, I've seen customers um, where we, within a digital team, we built out a project within a week. We were doing like a kind of a, a little hackathon and maybe a couple more days of, you know, handling kind of errors gracefully and all of that kind of stuff. But we built this thing within under two weeks. It took nine months for this project to be deployed. That's because there was such a divide between the way that we ran this digital team and the way that the operations team were running. Um, I can keep going on for examples here, but probably the more interesting thing is, well, what can we do to prevent causing this divide in the company? Having a digital team um, can be a very good thing. Having a digital team and siloing this kind of knowledge, this kind of way of working and the communication is a bad thing. Microservices are designed to break down silos, not to build new ones. A couple of the models I've seen work well is where we start to organize teams in terms of um, like vertical slices or pods as well, where a team doesn't consist of a whole bunch of microservice developers. It consists of a microservice developer, a product owner, uh, a network architect, a security architect, and they're deployed on a project. They contain all of the skills that they need to be self-sufficient in delivering that project, but they're all also part of other teams across the organization, so they're able to continue with those communication links and break down those silos. Um, ASOS, for example, they do everything is digital for them, right? Um, their um, integration of microservice teams act as consultants. They contain the knowledge, they contain the best practice, and when projects need to be done, they go out and they work with whatever team is doing those projects. So they're kind of federating themselves out. How are we doing for time? Oh. Um, my last point on adoption. Um, we, and this kind of goes back to something we we're actually talking about over lunch. Um, it's very easy when you're thinking about microservices to say, this is how we build them, this is how we deploy them, this is how we manage them, cool, done. Let's move on to the next service. Producing the microservice is only half of the job. A microservice should not be considered done until you have completed it with all the necessary things for somebody to be able to consume it successfully and productively. We need to make sure, whether we're the owners of the microservices or the developers, we need to make sure that we can literally put ourselves in the shoes of our customer. Because they are our customer, right? Digital transformation is all about putting our customer first. Same is true for our microservices. We put our customer first. So we need to make sure this microservice, you know, it actually does what it's supposed to do in the first place. We've been very clear on what the requirements are, we've gone through, you know, a design first approach, done the swagger, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But also, once we've deployed it, it needs to be easy to find, it needs to exist in a portal, internal and external, depending on the consumer of that service. It needs to be easy to access, we need to have self-serve access for our services. They're never going to take off if someone has to ring you up or send you an email and say, hey, I need a key to use these 3,000 services. Um, they also need to be easy to use. This is why we need to have swagger for 
every single one of our services or some other specification language that describes how it works. And in the dev portal, we should have an API console or something like that that lets us understand how this service works, but it's not a 13-page long Word document that no one bothers to keep up to date. Thinking about this the other way around, um, when we're rolling out um, services, maybe we're doing our first project, go back and think, who are the different stakeholders in my organisation? Are there particular groups in here that are, have more of that early adopter mindset? Are there people who would want to kind of use a beta version of these services or participate in a pilot programme with us so that we can roll out our microservices implementations bit by bit, get feedback from these people, incorporate that into our continuous cycle of improvement, and then release it more globally? Um, cool. Uh, I know I'm running very short of time. So the last thing that I want to talk about is Business outcomes. Um, there is no point, as I said, doing microservices unless you're doing something useful with them. This is easier said than done because microservices are intangible assets. You can't touch them, you can't see them, you can't smell them. It's very difficult to understand, especially if you're not completely technical, it's very difficult to understand how they're actually helping us out. For me, I tend to categorize the benefits in five buckets. Um, we've got the operational efficiency. A microservice is designed for reuse. It's designed to make things easier when you are connecting things together or when you are um, carrying out processes within an application, fewer errors, if you've done them right, et cetera, et cetera. We have the developer experience. As I said, microservices are built to make the development processes easier, the operational side harder. Um, so we can think about this in terms of how our developers enjoy their jobs. Um, we've got, what have we got here? Architectural flexibility. Microservices should be agnostic to the environment that they're in. This is why Docker and Kubernetes are pretty much necessities in a cloud-native environment. Um, intelligence. Microservices and each individual microservice should be able to tell us Yes, stats on how it's being used and, you know, the underlying resource usage, but also can give us insight into which of our services are most valuable, who is using which of these services and when and what else are they doing. We can start to build up a bit more of an understanding of how the data flows across our organisation. And that is incredibly powerful um, because most of the data nowadays is not at rest, it's in flight because our systems are so disconnected. And we also have security. Um, that's a pretty obvious one, so I'm not really going to dwell on it. Uh, we're going to share these slides afterwards, so I'm not going to go through each of these, but the metrics that you use to measure your success will all look different to each other because they have to be driven by your own company's goals. There will be things in common, like uptime, like um, developer retention probably, but there will be things that are different and unique to all of you. My advice is categorize these in two buckets. You've got how usable is our service, that's what we've got on the left-hand side here, like uptime, error rates, performance, all of these kind of things that are more operational metrics, and how useful are our services? What value are they contributing to my business? How have services increased, hopefully, the amount of revenue we take through digital channels? How have services helped us to onboard new partners more quickly? With that, I am going to wrap. Um, question number one, why are you doing microservices? If you don't know the answer to that question, work out the answer and then continue. Um, or don't necessarily do them. Sometimes microservices aren't always the answer. Um, number two, have a plan, but Avoid analysis paralysis. You don't want to spend months defining everything you need to do before you start doing it. You need to see some results. So have a plan, but it's version one. You use an MVP. You iterate, you build out, you get feedback, and you scale. Make sure that you can emotionally connect, understand and connect with all of your different stakeholders. Bring them on this journey with you. Make sure that you know what business outcomes you're trying to achieve. Celebrate that. Use that to promote how well your team is doing. Um, and finally, don't forget the feedback part. Um, as 
um, I think uh, Joan said earlier, um, change is always going to happen. We need to make sure that we are prepared for that change and we are accepting of it, we're welcoming of it and we ask for it. Cool, thank you. I think I overran there.